Welcome, everyone. We have our special guest, Till, also known as Toasterson. We have Antrenig, we have Dave, we have Dan, we have Jan and Mohammed, and myself, Michael. So Till will pretty much give, get the floor today to talk about his wisdom on, on Solaris zones, now Illumo zones, and Rust and configuration languages. Welcome, Toasterson. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, I am Till I go by Toasterson on pretty much any uh, social media slash whatever platform we are. Uh, mostly I'm on Mastodon these days, so you can find me on chaos.social, uh, which is from the Chaos Computer Club, which I'm also a member of, um, which is, yeah, basically like German Swiss hacker uh, group um the association and i've been doing illumos for quite a long time i've come in as a packager and basically done a lot of stuff around zones and zones zone brands in illumos or mostly open indiana uh, this differs a little bit between distributions because there are certain ways you can differentiate that uh, but there is also certain ways you can unionize that and go into that detail. The programming language of choice is Rust these days. I've done Go for a long time. So there is a previous iteration of the current tools that is still written in Go, uh, mostly working with the OCI standards. So how to unpack OCI images into zones. Uh, but we have a couple of different implementations there, depending on the OS and distribution. Um, yeah, that's my main interaction at the moment, uh, other than looking for a job, basically. And yeah, I'm open for hire. I'm a developer with Rust, uh, do all sorts of backend services, sometimes games. I did a game jam recently, uh, made a little tower defense. Uh, together with a friend who did the modeling. I'm not good at 3D modeling. So, yeah. On the YouTube on channel, Rust. you find... Yes, it's a Rust-based game engine called Bevy, which is a purely... Uh, it's called ECS, Entity Component System. So it's a, very, it's a very interesting way of state management, basically. It's a highly parallelizable... Parallel parallelizable way of state management that you can uh, organize the parallelization statically even. So Bevy does a lot of this uh, runtime uh, stuff at compile time. So it gets to like a function being called 60 times a second. And you basically are working on a very short, very hot path all the time, but you get like, you know how you get out of the hot path. Exactly that one. And they shared the link in there. And mm -hmm. it's, yeah, thank you. when you do that, you, you start to realize how easily composable this stuff becomes because like it, it's massively composable. Um, yeah, it, it runs into the three other major game engines that are that are available. So they, it pretty much gives them a run for the money. Nice. Well, let's talk zones. Um, yes. We, the, w this is sort of dominated by previous jail people, some of whom have used it for decades, but we would love, we, how should I put this? it kept coming up that, oh yeah, Zones gets that right, Zones gets that right, Zones gets that right, such that we'd, we'd love to hear what the <laughs> promised land is looking like, and perhaps also where you think feel things were never quite architected correctly, if there are any such cases. Maybe I should kick off with a question, sure. which is, uh, till to your knowledge, the, like we at this point, we know the difference between the jails and Linux quote-unquote container, 
but mm-hmm. now we would like to hear more about the difference between jails and uh, idlumosomes. I think that would be the good place to start because f- f- w- w- that's like a good lecture for us. And also when I talk with Illumos people, they're like, oh yeah, Zones got that right because of this design decision in the architecture that we made. So one of our ideas is, should we build some kind of a demon over time that looks like Zones or does the jail ecosystem in FreeBSD needs a change in the kernel. So for that, I think the best question would be like, okay, what are the actual differences between zones and jails? Yeah. So uh, I think to structure it for you, Tom, I, I think I get mostly on what the, the jail details are. Uh, I'm more a user and developer, so I can't talk much about the kernel, but I do get the concepts on how it works. Uh, so how does it basically look? So somebody may have mentioned that the original sold paper is a descendant of the jails paper. So some people at Sun Microsystems looked at the jails paper and like, ah, we want to do this, but differently here in a couple of ways in the kernel. Um, basically what it boils down to is every process has a zone. And we just have one special zone that is the global zone that can manage other zones. Other than that, it's a flat architecture, so there is no nesting. Uh, I don't know if how exactly you handle that, uh, but Linux has nesting. And the main point about it is you kind of have like a product integration, what you would call it. So when you open up a zone, you don't start off with, oh, what's a zone manager or what's a a zone behind, but rather this is the zone with its administrative utilities. Uh, You can do some changes as a vendor to those utilities, but it's designed with a vendor customer structure in mind. So as a customer, you open the zone CFG tool and you can set every property, but you can also freely set attributes as you want or as the brand requires you to. These are uh, basically just called adders and they're basically everything from how much memory on a Beehive VM inside the zone you wanna give, which ISO you wanna mount into uh, and so on and so forth. And there's a couple of fixed ones uh, that are provided by the OS, which are file system mounts, uh, ZFS dataset delegations, which hooks into the ZFS dataset delegation code. We have networking uh, delegation code, which hooks into Crossbow, um, basically manages that for you. So within the zones configuration, you can do config management of the whole zones IP stack. And you don't have to worry about it. So you can go basically like, oh, I have a script. I set up a zones uh, IP settings and the zone does the item potency for you. That's on the basic side. We have the administrative utility, which starts, stops, refreshes the zones. And we have an administrative daemon, which basically does the implementation and hooking into the different subsystems. So Crossbow, as mentioned, is uh, uh, Yes, the configuration is declarative. However, it doesn't go as much detail as an OSPF or PKP speaker in inside a zone. Usual and daemons that are not part of any product of some microsystems are not integrated into the zone, but you can make them integrate into the zone. And that's what brands are for. So brands are basically, uh, there's a config XML in slash user slash brand user lib brand and per brand there's a directory and there is a config. In this config XML, you mention which scripts get run by the zone daemon and what arguments they take and in which order. 
Sometimes there's additional arguments. Uh, sometimes there's things that run in global zone. There's a couple of different things you can do. And you can then read the zone XML manually. And basically, based on the attributes in that zone XML, you can handle whatever you need. There is certain things on how to get the attributes in the environment, but it it ended development there. So there, there is a bit of improvement possibility there, but mostly you just end up reading whatever uh, config files you have. So you can do the adjustments uh, kind of thing. Uh, no, you don't need to do worry with XML because the XML is hidden in the background. All the zone utilities do that for you. You do not need to worry about that unless you're making a brand. So um, uh, uh, if if you have a zone, and obviously Illumos zones have an awesome integration with ZFS, uh, it's basically, I'm trying to look for similarities here with, with FreeBSD, by the way. So there's like a path in the file system that is a ZFS data set. Uh, as a deposit said, that is mounted to a file system and the zone is in there. Is that how it works? No. Promo that no? is oh. brand specific. That is oh. brand specific. Oh. The zone, as the user land tools as it is managed, does that with the two default brands that are provided, which are called linked packaging and non linked packaging. These brands are also linked to the packaging system of Illumos IPS. Uh, in that IPS understands zones and can provide a zone proxy. So whenever you operate within a zone, you are operating uh, on a subset of updates so you can basically keep the whole system with its child linked zones in step upgrade when you upgrade it so when you do a package upgrade in the global zone recursive it upgrades all linked zones as well and sometimes it's a little bit buggy because we usually don't do that because we try to get differing versions in there uh, and if you have non-linked pack non-linked zones which is the standard that i usually do you can upgrade inside the zone and also add other publishers into the zone. Uh, if you have linked, you can't have different package publishers uh, inside the zone and outside. Uh, that was basically how uh, some of the uh, software delivery worked back there. But today's delivery usually requires different publishers. Or if we do zones for building packages, we need a different publisher. So. Non-linked, it is mostly. Fascinating. Um, I, I remember reading the original paper where the, there was like this graph where like, you know, the state is, you know, installed and uh, uh, restarting and stopped. And uh, if I remember the manual would say that a zone is in, has multiple states, which is configured. I still don't know what that means, by the way incomplete installed ready running and shut down or shutting down uh are those states like in memory or is it saved in some kind of a database that is you know preserved over the state how, how is that is is the demon managing that or is the kernel managing that 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 sounds very weird part on part oh okay. uh so i'll be doing this question now so how do some straight states work Okay. There is a index file in slash etc slash zones that saves the state. This is basically a database, but it's a text file. You can edit it if it somehow goes wrong. Just be sure you know what to do because that file isn't documented. Uh, when you use the zone utilities, they basically modify this file for you uh, in a safe way with file locking, etc. pp. So thread safe. Um, what happens? So you start off a zone with zone configuration. And basically, you type your configuration script or your configuration commands. When you save it, the zone gets to the state configured because now the configuration utility has run. 
And when a zone is in state configured, only then can the administrative uh, utility run. And the administrative utility has a install step, which is completely customizable by the brand. Depending on brand, this does a couple things. For the Beehive brand, it creates the temporary zone file systems for log files. For the IPS brand, it installs the base system via IPS. For the sparse brand, it loop mounts uh, or creates the basic directory structure to loop mount user. Uh, for package source, it does the same. Also installs package source though. Um, and there's a couple other that do special things. My uh, brand unpacks uh, smart OS brands, uh, do the zone uh, dataset clone in this step. And the brand that I use for my smart OS like things uh, also does the dataset clone in that step. Or the, uh, this is this is also where like Linux brands comes in. For example, if you have an Ubuntu brand, exactly, right? it, it would, would it unpack would, it would, the Docker you know, image. Exactly. Okay, got it. And once it is installed, you basically have the cycle of starting and uh, initializing the zone in the kernel, and then you have a couple of kernel states, which is basically starting up, shutting down, running, not running, kind of thing. But most of the names are saved in the file and the kernel interface is, as far as I remember, not stable. So it changes whatever we need it to do. And nobody should use the kernel interface. Although there is a library function exposed in libc called zone, which you can use to create a zone without anything as part of your process, same as fork. But then you need to set up all the permissions because by default, you don't have any permissions. So if you do not set up the permissions, the first thing your forked child is going to do is fail because it can't do anything, not even run. It's like, oh, you want to run memory? Yeah, you don't have permissions, bye. And then you have a stale zone and so on. So then you need to do all the cleanup and it's mess. Please only do that if you are really sure what you're doing, and if somebody in Illumos catches you doing it and you're not sure, they're going to point it out to you. Friendly, maybe. So we have a couple more questions in chat. Um, so how are arguments passed to zones? Uh, you basically have a special thing called Ether. You can basically say add Ether, uh, set the type and its name and value, and then it ends up in the XML file. And then you can read that XML file. Uh, we do that with the Beehive brand in its script. This is a Python script that basically just does XPath to the uh, zone XML, which we copy into the zone and gets its properties from there and does its thing. Simple as that. Uh, so ZFS is just one kind of brand. No, ZFS is a subsystem different brands use for their purposes, depending on what they need to do. Some brands set up boot environments, some brands just loop mount or uh, unpack snapshots or whatever they need to do. You mentioned brand a few times. What is it? Uh, this is a funny story. So the name comes from... Uh, a vendor product, basically. So uh, a vendor needs to set up an appliance, uh, that kind of thing. So he needs to customize how zones work. And that's how he do it. It kind of establish itself as a name. Uh, you can think of as type or kind of zone or any uh, synonym for it. Uh, however, brand has established it safe as name and is in the file system hard-coded. Also, what is Crossbow? Crossbow is the network virtualization of Illumos uh, or the network stack of Illumos. This is the only network stack we have and it is hooked into every utility we have. There is a management event called DL 
MADMD. And there are several SMF services that start these on the global zone or if required in the child zone. Uh, however, the global zone can also prepare uh, crossbow links for a child zone. So they are zone aware. You can assign them to a zone. And same as the ZFS zoned property, they have properties that you can set. It's basically uh, when you know data sets on a set ZFS, it kind of does the same thing on a network. So you can set up a physical link and then you can just set up as many virtual NICs or Ethernet stops or overlay networking or 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 whatever. As long as it implements the Mac interface, it will work. And you can also have a VPN implement a Mac interface. And then you can plump uh, whatever virtual NICs on top of the VPN interface. And they're attached to the VPN only, uh, that kind of thing, which is done by IPsec. Uh, I don't know what FreeBSD's NetGraph is, but I hope I've explained uh crossbow uh crossbow decently netgraph we'll... is an object oriented network alternative networking stack basically which was implemented a long time ago to handle serial line disciplines and so on where you have crazy nestings uh, but mm -hmm. it isn't uh comparable because it's not a full instance it's basically a parallel packet processing system mm -hmm. and uh, to make full use of it at some point it gets exposed as an interface normal network interface but you can do things like ip over hdlc over ppp over synchronous something like links and that's why it was needed that way and had to be so flexible because there were a thousand different encapsulation possibilities over serial lines and so on. Uh, it's still useful for certain VPN setups. For example, if you have to terminate uh, DSL lines, then it's useful, but it's not really the same as Crossbow. Uh, the closest equivalent FreeBSD has to that would be a VNet, where you can have multiple instances of the normal network stack. Ah, and okay. they're connected uh, between each other either over a special point-to-point -point crossover interface and if e pair, which is basically uh, to the two ends of a virtual crossover cable, uh, or the firewall rules if you really want to do it that way. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, we we have it. It for us, it's literally a virtualized uh, network stack. That's so we have we, we have uh, layered. Layer That's two mm -hmm. uh, and layer one, and they're extensible. So they can be implemented by uh, kernel modules and they can provide their own versions of the network stack parts. Um, this is actually abused to extend some dioxide mm -hmm. for their P4 stuff. Mm -hmm. So Oxide Computer has a P4 compiler. Tell us about and P4 before you go too deep. P4 is a uh, definition language for network package managing for ASICs. Oxide has a full uh, one and a half hour deep dive of how th what that is and what it does and how they use it. Basically, what this is, is a programming language for their ASICs in uh, their networking switch hardware which also runs in Lumos. And you also have a thing they made called Opti, which is a bit of a parallel network stack at the moment, but it hooks into the extension capabilities of Crossbow in that it is a complete processing engine in Rust. Nice. And you can basically make your own processing in Rust now with Opti, although that is very experimental and never ever used in production 
And if somebody catches you, he'll look bad at you. He'll stare at you. Uh, to uh, make of P4, you need a, a network ethic with about the same uh, power requirement as one or two um, AMD uh, Epic server CPUs. I think they're smaller ones. But there is also uh, the Oxide VPC code, which is an implementation of Microsoft's VPC layer, as far as I am aware, uh, which uses the uh, VPC stuff and, of course, direct integration to DTrace. Um, and the fast path uh, zero copy kernel module that they're uh, basically copying and improving the Linux network stack from. Um, th that's another thing that got brought up, which is in Illumos, you can run DTrace inside the jail, uh, sorry, inside the zone. Yes. Uh, do you see your neighboring zones or only your own zone? I assume only your own zone, right? Uh, usually only the own one, unless there is some permission as stuff I've missed. There is a couple I of permissions see. you can set, but they usually are not set. Okay, okay, okay. And is, is that like some basically a mechanical work that is the kernel knows, oh, if the D-trace is being run inside of a zone, then allow this, don't, don't show that and stuff like that? Or is it some kind of magic that's because we would love to have D-trace inside a jail. As far as I know... Right now, there is literally no way to run D-Trace inside a jail. I think it's the way our interfaces are set up. But again, this is kernel kernel internal specifics. Oh, yes. OK. Uh, this is not something I'm very familiar with. Uh, unfortunately, okay. I'm also not familiar with D-Trace because oh. I can never got around to read the book. Uh, <laughs> however, it is. Uh, probably mostly user land probes that it publishes. What I would imagine, because we do hard code the zone ID to each process. So we know where each process comes from and we know which parts of the process are allowed to do certain stuff in the kernel and not. And mm -hmm. we also hard code it to the kernel module. So you can have NFS server in a zone, which is not NFS then in the publics there, it makes a special zone instantiated kernel module. Oh, okay. Which is the same that we do for the Linux and Solaris 10 uh, compatibility layers. So those are syscalls, but they're instantiated per zone. This is mm -hmm. also a config option you can set in the brand. So you can make your own kernel modules that only run in that zone that you launch with that brand. Oh, uh, here's my l last question before I go more deep. And if everyone has any other questions, uh, are there any G zone management tools that people use out there? Or like, is everyone, oh, zone config, that it just works. We don't need anything external. Uh, some of the second, but the main reason for that is the only stable interface is zone config. Okay. So anything else, has always been mentioned as if you're doing it directly the way I do or did, um, you are in experimental territory and you will have your popularity cut in half. Hmm. So please use the zone config interfaces because if we change something, we break you and we will break you as the okay. announcement. Okay. Um, okay. Either uh, if people like me are uh, venturing into remaking some utilities, uh, they can. It is possible. Uh, but you basically end up with having to send envy list to the daemon uh, and then having to manage the daemon, basically. So, so OK, here are some good things that we learned, which is one, yes, there is a daemon. Uh, it's not just in the kernel. Uh, two, you have this concept of a brand, which is awesome. 
Uh, luckily, as far as I can tell, we can have the same thing on FreeBSD with our configuration files or like templated configuration files with a yarn. You can correct me if I'm wrong. We can have a, a feature like that with like UCL includes uh, that will make people's life easier. Uh, three, um, you have a single network stack. I hope you also have a single testing suite for the you know operating system, unlike FreeBSD, where we have three network stacks, three testing suites, three firewalls. You know, so yeah. Oh, uh, and last bit is uh, you can run BPF layer stuff in the zone, right? Like uh, DHCP or an IPS or stuff yeah. like that very easily, I assume. And uh, does it does that give any kind of a security vulnerability? Like, is the zone able to... I, 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 let's put, put it as an open question. Is there any security vulnerability in that perspective? No. Okay. The network stack is on a layer isolated. There is a possibility to share the IP stack uh -huh. from the parent zone with a child. Oh. But then you are limited and cannot run a DHCP server. Of course. That sounds a lot like how Jared's work in the kernel. Yes. Yeah. Yes. With but the, the traditional the, aliasing setup and the newer uh, VNet enabled setup. And yeah. we usually by default make what we call an exclusive stack, mm -hmm. meaning both a Mac uh, virtual NIC full stack down to layer two is assigned to the zone dedicated also in the account. So uh, by default, you, uh, zones always hook into the network on layer two? Uh, kind of. <laughs> so you have some kind of software bridging and... We have virtual NICs. Yeah. We have a virtual layer two, layer, two, layer three. Uh, th that's actually a good question. So, like, do you manually create a bridge? You know, like, let's say, if config bridge create and then attach to those things, or like, is the daemon handling all of that for you? It depends. Oh, okay. <laughs> so both are doable. Both are doable. Uh, okay. Some brands are handling it for you. Okay. Um, however. The usual thing was uh, you mention which virtual NIC to attach to, and you were left with the setup because you can set up many, many, many different things. What we have is we have called the DL ADM layer or the kind of like layer two layer. Yeah, data link. Yep. Data link. And on that data link layer, we can basically grab the physical NIC attach a virtual switch to it, attach a bridge to it, attach a uh, multicast group to it, attach a whatever data link other thing we have to it. You can read man page of DLADM to see all the different versions. We have a couple, um, some for failovers, some for things. And you can do all sorts of weird stuff there. And what you do is you then have a virtual NIC, which you attach either to the ether stop, which is a virtual switch, to the NIC directly. You don't need a bridge. You can make a bridge and then attach it there, mm -hmm. although nobody does that. Uh, we either attach it directly or ether stop, which is a virtual switch. And with that, we have a in-kernel data link layer between two zones if they're on the same EFA stub. Um, we also have a other extension called Overlay, which is now upstreamed from SmartOS, which is a distributed virtual switch with plugin encapsulation and discovering capability. So, so something like VXLAN uh, on a bridge or, or between yeah. bridges. Yeah. One of the encapsulation plugins that we have by default is VXLAN. Uh, however, you can make your own. And you also have a discovery plugin, which defines if it actually needs to send a packet out to another system. And there is a protocol 
in the uh, joint called SV ports, SV LAN. It's it's it, it's a uh, it's, it's a very joint specific thing, which basically just gets that information from a database. And you can implement the C interfaces and make a plugin for it. And that's all user land. And there is a virtual ARP daemon, which does ARP caching and data link handling of that kind of stuff. This is really interesting. So, I mean, uh, the, the network layer is very similar to FreeBSD, except that you have way better um, uh, abstraction tools than we do and everything is way more standardized you know in our case is like oh here's a wiki page go read yeah. that and now you can configure vxlan in your case it's like oh no it's like part of the dl admin utility you give the abstractions with the command line and now it gets handled for you and th that is a very interesting so you know uh yeah the plumbing you know we you do have way better plumbing let's put it that way that's very interesting um uh the, uh the only difference i would like to make is that the opti stuff and the new oxide stuff that is mm -hmm. still in development that is not that integrated at the moment okay mostly because oh. they're still working on how to extend this stuff by rust and at the same time ship a product mm. Mm. okay um he here is uh something interesting that um uh, came to my mind when you were talking which is uh so you have a zone it's managed by zone config with xml configuration some information is in the kernel some information is in the is in is in databases that are files thank you unix and uh the, the the daemon itself is managing all of these and the daemon is also talking with the other subsystems such as the network layer uh you such as dl admin does your network layer also have a daemon yes uh but okay. only one that is it, it basically works at boot up because you have mm -hmm. to have some state persistent over reboots Oh. Uh, oh, mainly like which virtual NICs are configured to which NICs and so on. Right, and right. Device configs and so on. It's basically like a pool import. You would do a network import. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because it just hit me. Like you, you just basically turned everything into a daemon to manage the states properly instead of managing it inside the kernel, which is way more dangerous and... Uh, okay, that 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 does sound interesting. And how does this, uh, let's say, zone ad admin communicate with DL admin or any subsystem with any? Is are the communications happening in kernel? Doors. Okay. It's doors all the way. It's doors all the way. Okay, and we don't have doors on FreeBSD, as far as I know, right, Jan? You you had we some interest don't, in there. Uh, it has never really been attempted. The only port of doors I'm aware of has been to ancient uh, linux 2.2 or something and of course it was never upstreamed it was only a research project mm -hmm. uh, could you describe by... doors for us mortal okay a door is a way for to perform um interprocess communication yeah. uh, in a slightly structured way basically you pass in someone registers as a file descriptor a service and then it can be called and the Calling thread moves temporarily into the address space of the uh, called service, but that's an implementation detail. The important thing is you pass in a bag of bytes and an array of file descriptors, and you get back uh, the same thing. So you can pass multiple file descriptors in and out. And uh, if you need more data, the API allows you to grow your buffer. But if it fits, it's done in place. So. It can be a lot faster, especially on older CPUs, but Unix domain sockets and 200 lines of C gets you 95% there. I mean, uh, way, yeah. hmm? it's, it's hmm? almost uh, all other demons then use uh, NV lists over that interface as byte uh, serialization. Nice. It's so, basically the concept of Erlang's in-process in communication on 
on Unix, you know, compared to what what's our alternative on FreeBSD for demon demon communication? It's signals basically. You no, know, I don't think we have we anything have, else. Uh, we have uh, Unix uh, sockets in the variety of datagram, a sequential packet, and stream. Oh, uh, like any other Unix, which can also pass file descriptors, but the API is painful to use but once you have an abstraction of it like libnv it's easy to use it's just that the incomp minute incompatibilities between different unix like operating systems make it very painful to write correct portable file descriptor passing code but just passing streams over unix sockets is trivial and see and the other thing we have is yes yeah, signals we have uh, a variety of file descriptor types which can be used for IPCs, like sealable memory regions. Uh, so you can have a special kind of anonymous memory uh, reference by a file descriptor, which can then be sealed. And you can make sure that nobody has the permission left to truncate, grow, or write to this area so that you can map it and trust the mapping will be there. We have uh, the Linux style event uh, file descriptors. We have pipes, we have signals. Uh, we have different ways to set up shared memory. We have legacy system five IPC. So fair enough, everything fair required. Uh, <laughs> and, but doors are a very neat interface and it would be nice to have, but it's, mm, it can have a performance impact, but if you require that high of an IPC message rate, you're probably doing it wrong. And yeah, something like LibNV gets you there as well. Yeah. Right. Right. The only difference is between Unix sockets and doors is that doors work through zones. You can oh. specifically punch holes in zones through doors and Unix sockets will not work. Uh, that's not a problem on FreeBSD because Unix sockets can be uh, have a well-defined behavior across uh, jails and you mm. can cross jail boundaries using Unix sockets. Be uh, for example, you can use a null FS mount point with a bound Unix socket inside it and mount uh, this directory containing a set of sockets into a jail as a read-only null event, and you can then, then connect and so on. Also, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, example, Jan, if can... I got it, if I got it correctly, if there is a socket inside the child, inside the jail, the parent can just open that socket and now the parent and the jail connect. can communicate. So there's nothing in FreeBSD like the uh, ugly abstract namespace of Linux. Uh, you, where you can address a Unix socket in an abstract namespace, which lives outside of all other namespaces. So uh, connecting to a Unix uh, socket is always done through the file system. So if yeah. you can access the file system, uh, you can connect to it. Okay. Okay. That, that, okay. So yeah. The, and the... You can use NullFS to, uh, yeah. Take a directory of sockets you want to expose to a jail and mount it into its uh, jail route. Somewhere. Yeah, there is two ways with zones. Uh, number one is the same to do the same with doors. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically mount a directory of doors and you can access them. Number two is you can call a process inside the zone with the zone enter and pass it a not registered door handle, which does mm -hmm. not have a handle in the file system, but rather uh, basically calls itself into the zone. Doesn't There does not need to be a binary <laughs> in the zone mm -hmm. and can pass its forked zoned child a, mm -hmm. a or zone so. entered child a file descriptor with the door. What fascinating. You can do something similar in FreeBSD. The problem is, as I just described, that normal uh, Unix sockets need uh, the file system namespace for multiplexing so that you can have a multiple incoming connections to a single uh, 
listening socket. There is a nasty workaround I found in FreeBSD to get by without it. If you you can use a Unix socket and use Capsicum to restrict it so that the only thing a client can do with it is either inherit it to another process, pass it along, receive a message or close its file descriptor so that you can no longer modify the blocking behavior and so on, so that you can't mess it up and you can't send on this socket anymore. You can only have a connected socket and the only thing you can do basically is pass a copy to someone else or uh, receive a message from it and the uh, server will then just pump ever new messages containing only one half of a new socket pair to this pipe and you limit the socket buffer to something small so that the back backlog equivalent isn't too high. And effectively you've re-implemented uh, through existing interfaces, uh, something like connect to a socket instead of a path. And that way you can get by with no writable file system if you have a way to get one initial file descriptor. But it's basically re an accidental feature. It's not designed in, it's just that there are enough interfaces to make it happen. Yep. Uh, a small correction on the notes. We Please. do have we do have abstractions on doors that are not libnv that make it very useful, very concerned, just send bytes, which oh. as far as I'm aware are libc. Hmm. Although please read the man pages to, in to include the correct library if you need to. That's what we made them for. Can you highlight where that is? And I'll do my best to correct that. Man or doors. This documentation I know on DOS is still the uh, Oracle mirror of the official Solaris documentation from the Solaris 10 days. Uh, depends what you need to search for. If you need to search for guidance on what to uh, write on an Illumos system, you can use illumos.org man pages. Slash man, I think it was. Yes, slash man. Is and... this vaguely correct? Go ahead. I don't post the manual page. Yes, the there are C interfaces. And if you look there for doors, or hmm. ah, there was a door thing. Yeah, it's in, in slash man, then you have to go to the section for uh, the C yeah. library, uh, which would be, I think, 3C. Yes, 3 and 3C. And 3 letter. But, but, but 3C, yeah. Yeah, the standard C library functions. Yep, in section 3, 3C. And then you would have all the doors and stuff as far as I can tell. Yep, yeah. There's the call bind, get param, etc. cetera. Uh, if there is yes. another uh, thing, you know, for the higher level, I couldn't find it, but maybe it's not in here. Maybe it's in another section. Your sections are very interesting, by the way. You have like man three head, man three KVM. It's like, this is neat. I think in 3BSD, yep. we only have numbers, right? Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine for games. Nine for games? I guess so. I'm not sure. That's just. Uh, we have like men three for Lua as well. So uh, I guess if we want more, we just write them. Yep. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's correct. We just also got man three Lua. Yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. Paul is games is six for anyone who's into games. So, yeah. Yeah. Any other thing would be in the uh, books that we have for implementing stuff. Mm. 
So uh, this is actually very interesting. You know, I, I, I did learn a lot and definitely we need a, a demon in FreeBSD. We don't have a demon. We haven't never had that all this time. Um, uh, another question. And one this thing is to that demon, yep, by the oh. way, uh, the demon is one demon per zone. So That's interesting. Only, so it's only one demon per zone and it's written in a way that it can crash. And how do those uh, let's say i have two j uh, so two jones which are dependent on each other how would they signal readiness or failure to each other so um how do you observe mutable state changes uh, we sorry, don't states okay that is so, that is not part of that demon layer you would need okay. to implement it on top of that okay you can basically just call zone admd or so an ADM and observe the changes there in machine parsable form. And do, yeah, I was going to ask that. Do you have a common machine parsable form or a library for that, like libexo or? Uh, All uh, our ADM commands can be called with minus p and output in machine parsable. Okay, so it's going to be tab separated, uh, orcable. Semicolon orcable. Okay, nice. Very nice. Okay, that's very nice. Um, so you have one one daemon per zone. That's a very nice design situation. So you don't have a master daemon running always in the background and in case that crashes. Okay, very similar to what we have for Beehive, apparently, on for EBSD. Because in Beehive, we also have a daemon. But, you know, you don't talk to it as a daemon. Um, th that's also very nice. Uh, this is my joint uh, brain talking at this point from their marketing. Uh, obviously, they can, you know, they have this big control panel that manages a lot of things. Uh, one thing that you said in the beginning about Linux branded uh, zones is that uh, based on the brand, so let's say if it's Ubuntu, I assume it's going to run like something like Deb Bootstrap uh, in the setup, in the installation process. So it will, you know, install the base operating system, etc. cetera. Uh, and you, you folks can also run containers on in, 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 in Lumos. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a smart OS a specific thing or not. Do you have like a, some kind Kinda. of utility? Yeah. Do you have any idea of how that works? We would love to hear because we also want to be able to bring this OCI layers and put them on FreeBSD as a regular file system so users can use. It's uh, there's two implementations. One is smarter specific. One is mine, and another one is uh, OmniOS. By the way, um, how does it work? Very simple. Um, OCI is basically a bit of tar uh, switched together with wipeout files. And you can do it with wget and the shell script in 10 lines to unpack that into a data set and call it a day. And that's what we do. I know it's very, it's, it's very anticlimactic, but that's literally what we do. <laughs> So on FreeBSD, some people have done fancier versions of that too. Um, to me, the trade-off for this seems to be, but what happens when I'm running a million containers and I care about that disk space cost in itself? And I don't think there are very, very many people in our world who have that constraint. Um, they um, maybe have hundreds and thousands of jails, but not millions. Yeah. So here's what, like here's what we learned. Yeah. Here's what we learned. Um, most people do not have a gigantic public cloud infrastructure. Most people uh, that run this stuff have themselves, uh, maybe a bit others, and the heterogeneity of the base containers is not going to be that great. So if you have a couple of layers, you can just do whatever the Docker driver does and unpack every layer into a new snap clone of the data set and then snap clone from the correct data set into the next correct layer and manage all of that and go crazy by having all of the graphs in a graph database somehow in ZFS and trying to keep that state. or you can do what most Docker people do, you squash the layers, 
You can do that also with several OCI utilities, namely Scopio, where you can basically squash the layers down to one tar file and just unpack that. If you have some setup that has disk space requirements or boot up requirements, you can do the same thing Microsoft does and just mount the whole thing over SMB or NFS and put it up on however many nodes you need to. You have even um, more options available in FreeBSD. Yeah, there is also <laughs> Plan 9 FS. There is also whatever we were thinking about. Things, uh, yeah. yeah. We were, yes. there were CPL also for, for iSCSI. Uh... Yeah, well, iSCSI would need a whole block device. We were usually thinking about just throwing out the file system layer. Yeah, but for Beehive or some other things. Uh, there yes. was a question about whiteout files. Can you explain that? So whiteout files is a Docker <laughs> invention. It's a terrible hack. Yeah, it's a terrible <laughs> hack to basically allow you to mark which file in a later tar file has been removed. How do they encode uh, that in tar? Sorry? How is that encoded as an extended attribute, uh, which is well no, known it's just to the file. Tools? It's just a file with an extension dot whiteout. Oh, and then uh, the name without the dot whiteout extension is removed. Exactly. OK, well, that's really. Uh... That's really disturbing. It is how, in the early days of Go, uh, you were able to modify tar files without writing your own library. Wow. OK. OK, so like if, if and this, I'm just throwing an idea here. If there is like Etsy host, that was a bad idea. Etsy config netf dot whiteout. It means that the, the native file shouldn't exist. Precisely, unless in a later what? layer, it is created again. Oh my God. OK, here. OK, what if it's a directory? Play recursively. Yeah, I don't think it works for directories. OK, huh? OK. Okay. We, we didn't need a white do... directory. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, the... I think it, ge it generates either a whole whiteout oh. section or it recursively deletes the directory. I have to check it out. It's a not documented behavior from Docker. That's a not very documented behavior. Okay. FreeBSD UFS, not ZFS, has support in, in the file system format for a special kind of file which is a um, whiteout file, exactly. It's a file because historically you could, uh, when mounting a UFS file system, you could say, mount this in union to the other UFS file system, which is already there. And then it would search them in order of mount going back in the t in time. So search for the newest first and so on. And you could have in the overlay, a whiteout file hiding a, file of the same name in the underlay. And now no other file systems other than UFS support this. There's no support for this type in the uh, under structure of uh, ZFS, sadly. And this at least used to work for the uh, union mounting of file systems without going for a union FS. Uh, which does has the interesting side effect is that it is not applied recursively. So each mount point has to be union mounted in turn if you have nested mount points. And I haven't had the time in ages to play with it, but it's there. So you have a one-to-one -one representation. In ZFS, you don't have this. So you could use a union FS, but for FreeBSD union FS, which I've played with the last few days, has cost me like at least five kernel panics uh, doing accidental misconfigurations. So whenever you- That was do, recently? Uh, yes, in 13.2, oh. if you look at it funny and accidentally mount uh, the same, one mount with the same arguments twice, 
uh, on accessing the mount point, you panic. And it, because Please it, document that and yeah, report back as appropriate. Yeah, I haven't had the time because I wanted to get something else ready for today. Yeah, totally, of course. But yeah, we, that's that's one of the to -do, to broader to-do list items. But, Go ahead. But, uh, so Union FS's warning, while it hasn't eaten any data, are still well taken in the man page. Uh, that said, is there a Union FS on Illumos? Uh, no, sure. um, uh, not that I'm aware of, unless somebody is experimentally working on it. Right. So, uh, so behind closed doors. Uh, I know there is a UFS on Linux, and that had this kind of wipeout feature where Docker originally picked it up. That's right. a user space overlay via Fuse, right? So terrible IOPS. No, it was uh, it was. I think it was user space somehow, but not Fuse. It was it was in a lot of Linux distros then, and without Fuse. Okay. Uh, but so, it this superseded by OverlayFS in Linux at the moment, and I think that kept the vibe out feature. Yeah, or wider, and the, and the performance impacts from it, it's it's uh, uh no good. Yeah. Um. So, so talking here about how you distribute pack um 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 what do you call them brands? Sorry. Um, yeah. Have you looked at using like package source to distribute this? Um, or thought about this type of thing? So the the reason from our perspective for using our, our packaging system for this would be that um it's widely available. It works over HTTP. You don't need any clever service to do it. Um, and it has uh, checksums and um, signatures built into it by default. And it's very easy for people to roll their own systems as well. Have you been down this path at all? It is by default distributed via IPS as the whole Illumos system is. So that's package source with the extra bits then, is it, from IPS, IPSs? IPS is our package management system, which has the same features. Right. And additionally, some more. Uh, it includes things such as facets, uh, which is a capability to slim down a package without having to make different versions of the package for, say, if you want to have the development headers. You can mark each individual file with a uh, kind of like trans with what is called a transform. Mm -hmm. And transforms basically are like regex rules that you can apply uh, to actions. So you can do a pipe-based post-processing uh, of all packages. And you can do that on binary, on already existing packages, or you can do that during the package build process, which is the default. Mm -hmm. And the IPS system keeps a complete database of the state of the system. So if you ever mess up the system and you have data corruption and you don't know what got fixed or if a virus got in there and you can only restore your data, you type package fix and it will fix your system. And That's it can bootstrap yes. itself from the network so as long as the repository server, which is HTTPS, is available, it can from the co from the uh, catalog of installed mm -hmm. packages bootstrap the whole system state. Fascinating. That's but, that's like FreeBSD then... audit plus plus. Yeah. Because we in FreeBSD we have PKG audit that does an audit. But it would be nice to say, oh yeah, this thing got corrupted. Fix that for me. You know well, that that's plus like plus it. plus Take plus. It. It. So it. so IPS has its descendancy from apt. It's made by the same person. And it additionally to that feature. As an we, oh, yes. Okay. R R rest in peace. Uh, he worked for uh, Sun Microsystems at OpenSolaris and basically took all the lessons he learned from apt at the running Debian system and restarted from scratch. Uh, made this IPS system. It's completely re-implemented. It implements all the features that Debian had at that point, 
which was update alternatives, which became facets. So you can basically enable and disable features of all packages in the whole image at once. It is now image-based, so it is partially a kind of Docker, but better. Uh, it is packages within the image, and you can merge this offline, so you do not need to operate online on that image. You can basically modify the metadata and keep just a little piece of data and send that out and hydrate the image and basically install the complete system state from scratch. You can combine those images into multiple types of images. So we have, uh, no, that's the same IPS, but a different fork. A couple of different more features, but it's the same base. So OmniOS, is, OmniOS, Open Indiana, and all Illumos systems are using the same IPS, as is Solaris. The Solaris IPS is still open source, as far as I'm aware. Uh, there are no paths. Uh, what about paths not covered by a package? Uh, IPS doesn't really care about it. So there is a couple of things IPS does uh, very intelligently on the things. So what it does is it has its thing called actions. So actions are what do you do to generate a certain system state? Most action that is used is called a file and any file in the same directory as a file action pack IPS doesn't care about. So if you remove it, it the other file that you left there still stays. If, however, you have a directory action and that gets removed, um, that basically puts the directory into a lost and found because that directory was not supposed to have a file there that you put there manually. And there is also linting that you do on all those actions and which you have. And then when you do package audit or verify, it's going to scream at you if you do that. It also has the capability of Git style merging configurations and partial downloading of only updated files because every file is mentioned individually by checksum. So uh, there's a couple of things that you manage with IPS and a couple of things that you don't manage with IPS. So, uh, uh, so a question comes about what if an attacker drops a payload into .root.profile? Home directories are not managed by IPS at all. So things that do happen in a home directory are the user's problem, not the one of IPS. All home directories are considered data. You can how, yes, uh, although the system state ones are caught. So user things, uh, so it, if people think about user homes, user homes in Illumos are intended to be mounted by NFS by default. That's why the standard homes are in slash export because that's uh, the intention to merge with NFS4. And the point is for that you are uh, by default, given a set of a data set for the user, so you can catch any user corruption with ZFS and snapshots. We have a utility called Time Slider in Open Indiana, which does that automatically for you in a nice UI and integrated into the Nautilus file manager. Um, that's basically around that capabilities, but the most capabilities we use it for is we can have one package that can cover multiple architectures and automatically installs the right files, depending on which variant of the package you want to have set. You can set up variants on each image and each image can be a global zone and its child zone has two different images. So you have a non-global zone package uh, uh, variant. And 
only actions that match non-global zones can be installed. So if the driver packages get installed, but they only have actions for the global zone, no drivers will be installed into the zone by courtesy of the packaging system. Um, this is also useful for multiple architectures because ARM, oh, wow. Spark, and x86 can share the exact same package name in the exact same repository. And depending on which variant you set up, the correct package gets installed. But you're not limited to having to set up a Spark system on a Spark machine. If, for example, you want to prepare a disk, uh, disk image or the live bootable ISO, you basically just install a full root image into a directory and just package that up into an ISO and then live boot it. That's what mm -hmm. our uh, installer mm -hmm. is based on. That's really fascinating. Like you don't have to build separate images for each architect. No, you don't have to build separate data sets of packages for each architecture. We have to build the packages separately, but we then merge it into one fat package. Nice. Mm. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, very... On, the, on that topic, uh, yeah, sorry, Jan, go, go ahead. In theory, you could even have multi-architecture ELF files on your next. It's just that nobody does it that way. But uh, yep. Apple does it with, with Mac O, so they uh, really do ship uh, code. Potentially, you can ship code uh, in a Mac O going back to 32-bit power PC, 64-bit power PC, 32-bit Intel, 64-bit Intel, and 64-bit AMD. Uh, sorry. Arm for um, in a single executable on a Mac, and you can then run it on macOS like 10.2 to uh, 13. Yeah. I thought you would take it. But you can't do much with such uh, an executable because you're yeah. spending too many different incompatible API versions. Yeah. Uh, to make it simple, yeah, we have multiple ELF files, but in the same package and on the same path. And the package system validates that none of the two can be installed at the same time. So if you make a package that has two, one for Spark and one for ARM, and you didn't set the variants correctly, it's going to scream at you with the audit so and linting. How is it handled for uh, cross-compilers? And uh, if I want need something like the runtime stops and so on for multiple uh, architectures installed on all systems. Uh, we do not put all stops into the same file. Uh, we put it into different prefixes. Okay, so they're just not tagged that way. Uh, yeah, because... well, we kind of have to do it on our build systems with ARM and I just Whenever I do ARM, I just put it on the slash opt slash solarm slash ARM because I don't want to be bothered to put all of the stops into the thing. Uh, we have the, we basically then use the sysroot uh, flag from GCC. Uh, we basically then, well, our aim, ARM bootstrapping script grabs the ARM version of OmniOS and puts it under a directory as a full package install of a whole system mm -hmm. under there and just calls that a sysr. Yeah, I, I was actually going to ask about that. Like, uh, how do you update your systems? I'm talking at the, the, the base operating system because uh, me and Michael, we have our scars on this topic because uh, <laughs> FreeBSD free update, it works, but it's not like we like it. It, but it does work. And there's a huge movement right now about having package base where the the base operating system is 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 managed by 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 the package manager. Do, uh, do, do you use the the IPS as a package manager of the base operating system as well? Did I get that right? Yes. And so you have package base basically. You every let's say GCC. What 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 do you have in your the zone Adam LD Adam? Everything is a package. And yes. the package man, okay. And the, can they be of different versions? Do they be in different versions, or are they like you know, let's say 2022, uh, 2023, January 2023? How does that work, or is it custom per distribution? So, here another feature from IPS comes in. We have a couple 
ways to manage that. For one, we can set up requirements and dependencies on the version of the package. And number two, we have a special dependency called incorporation. So an incorporation is a patch level of the OS. With that, you can ensure that a operating system image has exactly a specific version of a set of packages as you wanted. What was the name for that? Incorporation. In, in, in like cooperation? Incorporation. Yeah. Okay, got yeah. it. Cool. Interesting. I, 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 I didn't get it. Can you explain that again? So an incorporation dependency, that's a special package or a special dependency, special couple of actions, uh, basically grabs a whole set of packages all together, specifies precisely at which version, uh, and oh, this is something I have to explain, fault management resource identifiers. Sure. <laughs> oh, so we're the, getting into SMF territory at last. <laughs> uh, kind of. This is FMD territory. This is fault manager territory. This is hardware uh, device management fault territory. So the fault manager has uh, a way of uniquely addressing resources per system uh, called default management resource identifier. Uh, usually that's kind of like the device path on slash devices, and that's device tree related. Uh, but it has this specific fMRI and it kind of got its way all the way through the system. So SMF has it, uh, IPS has it, any other thing that needs to report a fault to an administrator and or automatically fix it or handle it has such an identifier. So packages do not have a name, they have this identifier. This is basically a URL. In that URL, you have a kind of namespace. So you have a, a long URL separated by slashes. The publisher can or cannot be part of that URL. Uh, this is signified in the initial uh, URL start. And we have a special versioning handling for that. So the version part of that URL has the package version. The version of the API of the operating system it was made for, or the ABI, which at this point is frozen to 5.11. So Sun OS 5.11, Solaris 5.11, Solaris 11. And that's a version in the string that we can set in the package manager. This is set during packaging. Another part is the branch version, which can or can not be, depending on what you want to say about it, uh, the version for the distribution that you have uh, compiled it for. On Open Indiana, this is just the uh, year uh, and the uh, incrementing number. On OmniOS, this is this uh, OmniOS release that you're uh, building for. So these are different branch versions and there is certain features in the image that you can set. So you can you can or cannot install packages that are for a different branch version. You can never install packages that are for a different ABI version. And the package version is for detecting upgrades of the package. And then there is a timestamp as a final denominator if you have two uh, package versions for the same ABI, for the same branch, for the same version, but with different timestamp, the newer timestamp wins. And that's how we uh, verify that, say, for if you have FreeBSD 13 and FreeBSD 12, those would be two different ABI versions. And IPS would not be able to install FreeBSD 12 packages onto FreeBSD 13. Wouldn't work. 
release the package refuses that as well, unless you set an environment variable telling it, I really want to shoot myself in the foot. Yeah, there is an image variable you can set. Not documented for reasons. No, at install time, you can override this. If, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but the image has a configuration file for us. So in that configuration file, you can set stuff. Hmm. Also with so the, the package utility. Yeah, is that um, you enforce this for what I think in the brand then, don't you? And we just do it with the pack of invocation, which is if you want to load YOLO stuff all over your file system, then be my guest. Um, if you've picked the specific ABI, OS version, whatever, then clearly you know what you're doing. Um, and while that sounds a bit sarcastic, it's actually super useful because it means I can create um, like a, uh, I don't know, um, an ARM64 FreeBSD 12 release from an AMD64 um, FreeBSD 14 um, version and create the data set, put all the stuff in it, and then package it up and it's ready to go. Um, yeah. We can set those properties during creation of the image. So with package, we have to create an image, set yeah. properties into that image, add the publishers that we want to get the uh, packages from to the image. And then only that image gets modified with package install actions. And you have to specifically name that image. If you do not name the image, it falls back to the OS default image. There is always an image. You never yeah. edit a <laughs> system or anything. You always edit an image. And there's different kinds of images that have different kind of constraints. Like if you have a user image, you can have the user install packages for himself. But those get saved in a special uh, subdirectory, hidden directory, that the user has kind of like his uh, user home slash bin. But it's a special defined directory, and only certain packages can be installed that way. Mm -hmm. And then there is also a partial image that works kind of like uh, slash opt local does, where you can install a kind of almost the whole operating system technically, but it's intended for things that want to deliver to opt local and want to have different versions, like having multiple instances of PostgreSQL with multiple versions of different binaries uh, available on the same system. You can make partial images and install the specific prepared Postgres packages only into the partial images and use IPS to upgrade uh, all Postgres instances. So, 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 okay. So this is okay, nice. That's for sure. <laughs> it's like it's built the right way. Um, another thing that I noticed, and this is more of a personal one. Uh, you did work on OpenFlow. I think it was called OpenFlow. Open flow. Uh, that's my company's name. That's not yeah. the open flow thing stuff. So no, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Uh, uh, so uh, does zones have? So one of the again marketing department of Jordan talking here. Um, they have this awesome idea where you can do you know Docker host equals to the some Docker host, which is actually a joint machine, uh, mm -hmm. smart OS running. Do you have distributed zones like a a a a zone client running somewhere else. Does that make sense? No, we don't have to. No. Okay. Okay. So that's just an abstraction layer that is smart OS specific. Yes. It's literally, hey, the Docker API is HTTPS. We just, yes. and rest, we just lay our ass off. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Visualization. Okay. Uh, okay. That sounds, in, that sounds uh, very nice. In one of the Oxide and Friends, uh, episodes uh, they were talking about the history of Docker on Solaris mm -hmm. and mentioned how uh, Docker was very confused that they didn't want to talk about licensing code since they had re-implemented the protocol <laughs> themselves. So uh, whatever Join used to do there, they didn't use the Go implementation. 
Yes, they they literally implemented the REST API. They That's implemented the Docker interesting. API instead of wrapping it uh, up until it ran on uh, smart OS. Precisely. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. And on top of that, if you use the, like you said, SmartOS has their own version, but Illumos also has their own version, the shim layer that gets the OCI tarballs and put them inside of the appropriate locations. Now you can have Docker on top of Illumos. That's that's also very interesting. Um, yeah, I think yeah. there's a lot of things that we can learn from here. There is a... Um shim layer that you can basically use on top of zone cfg uh, a Perl script that just copies the docker image in the right place and then boots the correct zone brand for you it's kind of like a little bit making it making only a bit, bit more smart os ish with vm adm um, and i've made my own vm adm uh, so that's kind of like what people are doing so this we usually put the layer on top and let that handle the stuff does this uh, implement its own brand? So, uh, so, and if I wanted to, how would you go no. about implementing your own brand? ZADM is a layer on top of Zone ADM and Zone CFG. It does not implement its own brand. Uh, I implement my own brand in my project. And I can sh walk you through all the details. So, uh let me open github let is me that find... adm your project or is that just one part you said what is the that's only oss project is that that's only oss project okay so Got it. my project is this is the rust version yes so this one is my project called okay. aurora open cloud and i think i can share my screen can i do that I'm sharing, but I can stop. Go ahead. Ah, no, I can't. Um, I'll push again. Let's see. Two. There we go. You see your screen, but it's rather a high resolution for a call to share. Yeah, maybe uh, Control Plus for zooming. And also, are you also running uh, Illumos on your desktop or not? No, uh, okay. I, I, I am not as crazy to get KDE running there right now. <laughs> Is that big enough? Yes, 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 it is. Okay. I just moved you to be a 4K screen, but <laughs> the, the screen uh, streaming quality uh, drops every time you scroll. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, th this didn't That's happen during just Twitch. How video calls work. Yeah, I think it's Zoom, though. Twitch does a better job. Yeah. Or OBS. Anyway. Uh, I have implemented my own brand. So I have this, uh, all of this is made in Rust. So there is no C code here. So I have this uh, crate called OPC Zone. And in the brand, I have a couple of brands that are just the sources. And I have two basic brands that are the same, the OPC, OPC Native, so OPC is the open cloud prefix that we just put in. So we have vendor specific prefixes. Mm -hmm. So we don't claim the same names and do all this kind of fun stuff in the file system. OPC is mine. So we have uh, native, set image, Beehive and Propolis. Beehive and Propolis are basically there or are supposed to be there to basically run a Beehive or a Propolis VM in a zone. And native is uh, running a native Illumos zone uh, from the images I produce. And Z image is the brand that handles specific setups to do image uh, building inside the zone. So that I can have a couple of commands that uh, may do weird things in the file system and safely keep them on the zone. So looking at OPC Beehive, um, we have this feature on FreeBSD, which is a jail that runs Beehive, which yep. to all intents and purposes is just a process. That's what we see. Is this yep. the same here? 
or is this different? I'm just still trying to get my head around what brands are. Yeah, um, it's the same. Of Coca-Cola and Pepsi. So, okay. So you, in theory, could have uh, a brand that is actually um, runs a different, like, brand elf type thing, like you run um, Linux binaries yep. directly if people did the kernel work. Right. Yep. So it's very similar then. Yep. I can think brand scales and then it sort of logically works. All right. So what we have here in, we have two XML files that are mandatory for a brand to be a brand. Mm -hmm. That is config XML and platform XML. So platform XML is basically all the security stuff you set up for the zone. Mm -hmm. So here you have the global mounts that the zone framework will mount for you. Uh, you could do Uf, uh, UFS and all this kind of fun stuff. Most common one are loopback file system or VFS mounts. Mm -hmm. And in this special case, uh, there is a special file system called zone control, which in the global zone uh, gets exported as var zone control uh, and zone's name. Percent set gets expanded to the zone's name. Per uh, definition that's templating and slash capital R gets expanded to the zone mount point <laughs> in the global zone. Oh, and that does mean that like there is some location on the host where you can go to and do LS and now you are seeing the zones files. Exactly. Okay. Why didn't Docker learn that? Okay. <laughs> uh, they do that. Uh, well, they it's do. just very hidden. Oh, okay. It's just very, very hidden. Usually on the varlib docker yeah. overlays, Overlay something. UUIDs, hash, blah, blah. <laughs> there, okay. There's a trick to find out the directory. These... Several backup utilities know that. Um, yeah, that's kind of like, like the all the volumes and all the things are exposed into those directories. And if you know the formula, you can write a backup utility to just back up all Docker containers properly. Mm. Uh, yeah, so this is this kind is of like- This is DevFS. This is DevFS. So you have a slash dev into your zone. Uh, you can do without, uh, not recommendable. This is the special zone control where we usually place doors from the global zone. So whatever demon in the child zone can open and contact the global zone for certain control interactions. Like, hey, uh, I would like to shut down some specific thing or hey, I have no internet connection. I would like to uh, be openable in a serial terminal. Uh, please do some very things that you, whatever you would try to write the demon for or guest agent that doesn't use these zones networking or a monitoring daemon that uses the global zones networking with some things you write, whatever comes up in your mm -hmm. mind. This is the kind of like standard kernel view management file systems from Illumos. Mm -hmm. uh, Couple of things you may notice, couple of things that are a little bit legacy, like ObjectFS. Uh, what this is one, that? I have no detailed clue. No, it's like, is that old? Okay. So, uh, it's that old. <laughs> and you export the mounted file system again as a plotter file system? Uh, no. This are tab? so. No. This. The mount tab is a view into the kernel with a very implemented as a file system, but it's basically the mount tab. It's just a live view into the kernel. Yeah, it's FS tab as we say it. Okay. Yeah. No, it's more like probably the output for mount uh, dash v or something, or where yeah, mount dash v gets its information. Yeah, it's basically mount output. Proc is proc, our binary proc, uh, but for only the zone. So all this specific stuff is zone specific. So this is zone aware. 
as we mm -hmm. say. So in proc, you only see stuff from the zones proc. Mm -hmm. If you have this the the, the director here, contract is uh, about process management. Mm -hmm. So properly killing uh, processes and cleaning them up properly. Also That's required. FreeBSD is kind of missing. Uh, also required for SMF because SMF by default uses contracts for all its uh, processes it spawns. So it ke keeps crunch. So SMF doesn't keep tabs on its processes. It keeps tabs on the contracts. And whenever it should shut down something, it just shuts down the whole contract with all the processes in it. Hmm. Uh, the volatile database that needs to be cleared on reboot for SMF. And a author special view into the kernel like mount app. And the, I just looked up the object FS supposedly is the list of kernel objects loaded. Yeah, for the zone. Uh, all the devices the zone sees. So you have to mention every device you want to give to the zone here specifically. Otherwise, it will not have it. Can you wildcard? Yes, yes. Yep. apparently ah, they okay. can. So, so you're using okay. So the reason why a zone can see dtrace stuff is because you have dtrace as a devfs thing that you attach to it. That's a very is is that how it's built on FreeBSD? Does anyone know that? Wait, I have to check on FreeBSD box. I, I think the like reason dev... we we don't have um. Uh, we don't have it on FreeBSD. Is um, yes. it's too it's too dangerous. <laughs> it's like, uh, I would love user space D trace yeah. to be something I could rely on. Um, yeah, this one is zone aware D trace. So all kernel modules can be zone aware, so they yeah. can offer specific options depending on zone. So with with the file system, um, the dev file dev D trace on FreeBSD as well. Um, yeah, your D trace. So is D trace is a file system or is accessed as a uh, direct as, a as uh, device nodes in the slash dev slash D trace file system, but by default you have to be super user in the uh, root uh, jail. So because yeah, D trace yeah. is your get out of jail free card. Well, apparently, we, apparently, we do have that on on FreeBSD. There's a slash dev slash dtrace. So I assume, and apologies for side, side, side tracking here, just like we do with allow.vmm, where we basically just open the dev vmm to a jail. We can try exporting dev dtrace and dev dtrace, you know, wildcard to a jail and see how how it reacts to it. I mean, I'm not going to try it on production right now, but that sounds like a good thing to try. In the in the yeah after the call that that's very interesting and uh, sorry to to side load again what's lo-fi line sixty seven VFS that's VFS okay okay loopback file system interface uh it's the VFS uh but all of it is zone aware all of it are zone aware that's fascinating okay case that is the kernel statistics daemon which you can write user land extensions for. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is a capability? This device filter is can also be arch uh, architecture specific. For example, if you have open prom that you need to uh, put in there, which is mm -hmm. also zone specific. Uh, and it is aware of the network stacks which you're using. So all of this part are only shared if it's an exclusive network stack, not a shared one. And we have a special zone console, which is per zone. Or the login. Uh, no, this is a serial console. Oh, or a serial PTY. console or a PTY? A zone console. Neither. Exactly. OK, so it's its own thing. It's But you yep. do run some get TTY basically on it. Uh. Or kind the of SMF equivalent. You, you can run the Z login equivalent to 
directly attach me to the zone. Mm -hmm. And you are basically as if you're booting the whole system. Fascinating. And because you have a state management and these files are hard coded, right? It's Zcon, the zone name, zone console. I can attach to it and see the whole booting process, basically. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's that's really interesting. That's really interesting. And all everything that redirects to the TTI on the global zone redirects to the zone console in a zone. So any of the, oh, I'm publishing something to the console, ends up in there. Oh, no, Inclu now that, that one is problematic on FreeBSD. Because like if you try to brute force SSH on, on a jail, usually, usually the SSH daemon would print something in the TTY, right? That it says, you know, yep. uh, multiple attempts. In FreeBSD, it goes to the actual TTY. It doesn't go per jail, mm. unless it's configurable. Jan, you would know more? Well. That depends what uh, SSH does because it does it when it's running. Is it called? Uh, it just writes to syslog, mm -hmm. and then it's however whatever your syslog does with a message, and you can route it correctly, um, or you can what most people do just ignore it and send it to the uh, bit bucket in the sky. Um, but sure, yeah. you can get the access to the logs. You can even do other things like, I don't know, maybe feed it into a blacklist D or uh, and then sync that via BGP to uh, your other system so that you learn the source addresses of boot of networks performing boot force attacks. Uh, I mean, I understand, this. but like the, 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 my point here is that like our default, as far as I know, is going to print it to the TTY zero. The, the, mm, it will print the jail. No, TTY. it doesn't print to the TTY zero. It prints to oh. syslog D prints to the console device. Oh, the, on a physical box outside of a jail, outside of Beehive, this defaults to your uh, first, well, yeah, to the system console, which happens to be the first VGA virtual console on a PC. On some embedded system, it may be a serial port. Or if you redirect your system console, it could be the IPMI serial of a LAN port. Um, so whatever happens to be the uh, dev console. And you could probably do uh, provide a, you could provide a clever dev console to the jail. I don't know if any code cares to check for the um type or uh, the file type. So if you could track it with a sim link, because you can only put devices, uh, um, devices, directories, and sim links in the device file system. But you could, maybe if you could have uh, there and then have uh, the right kind, for example, uh, uh, a sim link to a null, virtual null modem device, where only one half is exposed to the jail. If that's possible, okay. you would get it into the host and you wouldn't even have to go through the networking stack. Instead, you would go through the uh, n virtual null modem cable. So FreeBSD has the special device, an uh, NMDM, which is basically just like an ePair is, is a crossover connection between two Ethernet ports. The NMDM is the same for uh, TTYs. Yep. Okay, hold that and thought. That's only getting a little off topic. <laughs> yeah, but but it's cool. Something like that exists. Indeed. Uh, but it would require some uh, blue code. I have a quick, completely different question for Till about architectures. You have mm -hmm. very casually mentioned ARM support, and I'm wondering if you can give us an an update description of where Illumos and friends are with ARM and other architectures like RISC-V? So we have uh, a repository here for which we call the ARM64 gate. And this is both the port to ARM64 and RISC-V64. Fascinating. Uh, if 
if I find chat, I can send you a message, uh, but I don't find chat. So what is at the moment working is booting in Quemu on a virtual or booting any virtual machine and bootstrapping. However, we have a hack to get a bootloader at the moment, which is not loader, which we are uh, waiting anxiously for Tomas to uh, port the ARM bootloader stuff over. And we've been bugging him for some quite some time. Uh, this is where uh, loader will start learning about NV lists because we needed a boot uh, capability to give the kernel information about uh, boot options and so forth. And since everybody was doing their own thing, uh, Thomas said, let's do NV lists um, or NV pairs or yeah, NV list. And basically then serialize that into a piece of memory and then have to kernel kind of deserialize that. Same as with x86 and multi-boot protocol. So, so what, what, what's multi-boot protocol? Multi-boot basically passes on x86 passes the boot options from the bootloader to the kernel. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Such as you know the, the which which boot environment and stuff like that. Device and so on and so forth and so many other things. Okay. Or boot in debug mode or mm -hmm. boot in special thing or whatever. Many many different things. Um, this is a uh, compiler setup and bootstrap environment for a, for to run this on x86 Illumos. It will get you a cross compiler. It will set up the sysroot for you, and it will start compiling Illumos gate. Then grab the IPS packages of Illumos gate, install that into a uh, virtual disk and a different root pool, and then give you a disk image that you can boot on Quemu, which does not have IPS installed at the moment. <laughs> but since x86 IPS can just handle an ARM image without any issues, it just puts the ARM stuff in another directory, another image, and just sends the image off the, on its way. Are they publish, publishing bootable snapshot images? Yes, or on your own? OS does. Okay. okay. Oh, I, I I peeked at their website during this, but oh no, I checked Open Indiana. In Open Indiana, my bad. There you go. Okay. Yes, uh, this not published on the website in any shape or form at the moment, uh, due to reasons of being very very alpha. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fascinating. So that's your platform file which you ship which says what the brand looks like. And it's very, I mean, the integration yeah. is done very nicely. On FreeBSD, we have a bit of a problem that like, for example, you would need to go and change the DevFS file on the host and then say, use this DevFS of the host. And, but in your case, like, okay, it's a single XML. Thank you, XML. And in there, you have all the things that you need, but that's the platform. And then here is the config, which I'm assuming is going to be the actual boot process. Yes. Okay. Uh, including other settings. Okay. So per brand, you can set a kernel module that gets loaded specifically for the brand. This was originally intended for uh, the syscall translation layers, such as Linux uh, compatibility and Solaris 10 compatibility. Mm -hmm. And you can just set any kernel module and it's available and loaded during the boot process. Uh, you should, however, use kernel modules that are sown aware due to obvious reasons, namely security, uh, which init to use because you can just specify your own init, which login command set login will log in the zone into. So when set login goes into the zone, it will call this command uh, and log in there. Sorry, so so dash Z, okay, the capital Z is the name of the zone. What's you? 
Oh, the name of the user is the user is the user. Okay. Yes, user. Yes. Okay. Uh, and these are basically there is a specific capability for uh, having a admin user available in the zone mm -hmm. that you can log into as. So you don't have because Illumos is capable to complete to run completely without root. Minus so you, having the entry in etc pass vd because some SMF service needs it at the very in it beginning. So you Other don't even that, need etc password file to exist to boot the system. No, that needs to exist. Okay. But well, technically no. <laughs> because you can boot the zone, you don't need etc password. Uh however, in it and SMF requires it. Oh, I see. So if you have SMF inside the zone, you require it. If you don't, and you just boot your own Python script that boots Beehive, you don't need it. I see. So the kernel doesn't care, but every common boot up path depends on it. Yes. And also in FreeBSD. Yeah, I just realized. Also in FreeBSD. Right, Jan? Because like you, you can run just like you would, you are running, uh, you know, yeah, or, the or sync. kernel. Um, so what happens in FreeBSD is that there is a kernel environment <coughs> variable called init path, which mm -hmm. is a, a colon separated list of paths the kernel tries to start as PID1 during startup. So mm -hmm. with the same default value, which normally finds uh, as bin init, and then it loads as bin init, and that once it's runtime linked, it gets started as first process and takes over the user land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Basically, mm -hmm. it brings up the system from single user mode to normal operation. And uh, you can totally write your in your loader uh, conf uh, in different search path, which uh, starts with something different. And then you can run your own uh, init process and that could be a statically link, minimal executable, which only prints uh, hello world until you turn off power again. Um, that's possible, but not very useful as a definition. I think the important part, which was mentioned is that Solaris doesn't require the fully unlocked omnipotent root to be useful at runtime. So you mm. can initially set up the system and then basically throw away the key. Um, okay. And that's the difference while... Mm, not quite. The difference is we have role-based access control and exactly. root can be a role. Exactly. You can break it up and after what you destroy the master key once you've Define the policy, right? Yeah, and the policy can be defined at install time. Nice. That's interesting. From, That's I mean, a from, part... from, from, from a vendor point of view, right? You can have a... Oh, okay. Appliance. Yes, it's both appliance and think of it like AWS. Yeah. It's basically the same system as AWS where you have your initial account uh, can do everything, but then usually you give out uh, admin accounts which have the policy and they can do whatever the policy allows them to do. Hmm. And that could be a full management, but you give out specific accounts and groups and so on. So but here you have login command, force login command, user command. What's user command? Uh, that's just for detecting and oh, set, uh, making it, sure okay. that the user, because you can have this admin user, mm -hmm. uh, just making sure that it exists basically okay. in the zone. Okay. Because and then the install is an actual. You could have whatever use, user database you want. So the zone brand only cares that the command returns successful, doesn't care what user database implementation inside the zone you come up with. Oh. This is a very good, nice way to integrate with like NIS and LDAP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
This would uh, be very hell interesting because we still run NIS in our infrastructure. I think we're the last. My condolences. But yes. Um, <laughs> love, we, we love it. it. It works, you know. <laughs> of course, get end integrates into that already. But if yeah. you have something yeah. that doesn't integrate into uh, get end, uh, you want another command to run. Nice. Very nice. FreeBSD also has NSS uh, and PAM like Solaris introduced yeah. the true world. Uh... <laughs> uh, just yeah. to clarify briefly, can can an unprivileged user launch a zone? I almost heard no. that from you, but I'm not clear. Okay, thank you. So after uh, and this well, is and what, the wait, reason and why do... because we will need to run a program as a privileged user to basically be able to modify the global system to mm -hmm. handle the zone. And this program I have made, this is uh, the program I also have a source code, Rust source code uh, in this repo. And this is my completely own program. And you can even specify the get opt line for it. Yeah. So hmm. that launcher, the brand launcher validates that your arguments um, match the uh, get up yep. line before it even tries to start your install script. Yep. OK. OK, uh, a quick point of order. We're at two hours, I believe. Um, do you want to rejoin us in a week and maybe go drill down? Or do we want to? I don't know, wrap it up at this point or or something else entirely. I'll just mention that the same that the same thing goes for all of you. These are all called hooks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these are all custom. Uh wait, and custom to you or custom to custom whatever the hell I made the hooks, those hooks to be. Can you scroll up to the beginning of this uh nesting layer? So okay. So just and where are your hooks defined? So, so there isn't a, but the set of hooks is a, it's part of a specific programs you provide to the system or have in the system. So, and any tag on this layer is a command or? Yep. No. It's not by layer, it's basically thing. I can later on. Uh, help you define privileges oh. because these are the rule-based access control privileges the zone gets. Mm -hmm. So by default, you have no privileges and then you need to actually be able to change owner of a file to mm -hmm. change on yourself and so on. Otherwise, okay. you can start a zone that can't change anything. You can. It's going to hurt you, but you can. So can it at least uh, exit itself or? <laughs> yeah, that it can. Okay. Process, ex oh, wait, you even have process exec and process fork as a privilege. So you could have a process that in a zone that can't run fork and exec. It, that would yes. be a single binary zone. That's like Docker, yep. but made in 2004. Okay. Yep. Mm. And that's basically detail. And we have a special zone aware privilege, which we can cancel, which where we cancel dtrace for the kernel. So then we only have user land. So um, dtrace here uses the rule-based access control system to limit itself. And I think we have to slowly wrap it up here. So let's have uh, final questions. Um, yeah. And then we can try, uh, continue next time. Yeah, so um, one, one my question is a follow-up of Michael's. Michael asked if you can have an unprivileged user launching a zone. You said no, and the reasons was, you know, the installation process. But from your config file, I realized that you can log in into a zone, right? Um, no. You can't log in into a zone. Okay. You can log in from a privileged user to an unprivileged user. Login from a privileged. I did wait, wait via the execution of privilege framework, meaning you need to have roles, not the root user. So you just need to have the correct role. up into multiple permissions. Yeah, it's it's profile. It's rule ba role based access control. 
Yeah. So fully. So 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 let's say there is a user named Hill on the host, yeah. and there is a zone, and the zone yeah. also has a user named Tell. Yeah. And you, as the user Tell, log into the zone as user Tell, not via SSH, but via let's say the login yeah. or something like. Oh, that's doable. Okay. Uh, Jan, we don't if have that on Freebie. The privileges there. are set well, up correctly in Airbag. Right in FreeBSD, I think we the the regular we have a can... trusted BSD uh, mandatory access control framework. Okay. To uh, handle mandatory access control, which is a superset of role based access control. Yeah. Uh, but again, the mechanism is there. The opinionated tooling making it possible to maintain your sanity when expressing uh, a policy isn't, uh, <laughs> at least not for the non-trivial cases. Um, and it may not uh, have the required granularity to uh, properly get rid of root. Most, but the infrastructure is there. Uh, no, um, Capsicum and um, Pledge exist. Uh, Pledge is something different, but Capsicum um, exists in a totally different uh, design space. Capsicum is a capability based security. Of course, but yeah, and is then, there a framework for Illumos? A oh. capabilities framework of some kind? Uh, Airbug is, is the rule based access control of Illumos, yes. Okay. Airbag is not Capsicum, it's something, the trusted PSD framework is a comparable thing. Fair enough. So is there another, I don't want to say sandbox, but something else on top of that in a Lumos? Another security mechanism? Uh, not only that the zone is basically the main thing, and then you can say per zone what roles it has. Fair enough. Sure. And then per user, and then the user is inside okay. the zone as well. So it, the user inside the zone can have different policies as the user in the global zone. Oh, that's it. Now that's interesting. Hmm. Now that's interesting because yeah. right. Well, here's <laughs> why. If you have okay, th that's a long story, and I don't want to go into it today because I've I've been okay, but... bit by that. But okay, but that's very definitely interesting. Uh, here's a, here's a very weird question, and you know you, you can say I'm dumb if if it is a dumb question. So in FreeBSD, when I do PS show all the processes, it will show the processes of the host as well as the gels. I assume it's the same with PS on uh, Illumos or not? Yes, uh, what and it has a zone filter. It and it has a zone filter, just like when and it will usually be dash Z or dash capital Z. Okay, great. So yeah. let's say inside the zone, you have a user with the UID 1000 whose username is tell. But on the host, you have a user, user with the UID 1000, but the username is Michael. Do you see where I'm going with this? If I do PS and show all the processes on the host, does it say Michael or tell? It says a very long ID. It says a very long ID. Huh. What's that ID it shows in? Is it... This is what it says. Uh, this ID is basically the UID inside the zone with a little prefix of Damn, very many that's zeros. that's so good. That's so, so good. It's basically the concatenation of zone ID and user ID. Um, plus minus. Okay, that's so goddamn good. Okay, okay. Like, yeah, someone so gets a cookie good. for that. Wow. <laughs> damn it! Damn it! This is this is way better than what we have. And wait a second. So, uh, I, 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 I however, if the user exists in both zones, it kind of shows it the same way uh, same because way. a lot okay. of this uh, fit because this is like the kind of mapped. Yeah, things because if they match and map, the, it shows it the same way. Kind of like. that is so good compared to what we have. That is really so good. <laughs> like what we have is so is not that well designed. And I tried making a fork of PS for my own experiment, 
but then it ended up forking and the j- 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 attaching into a jail so much that even with like a couple of thousand processes on my home server, PS became slow, like almost 10 times as slow. Um, yeah, we have that um, from the kernel. We just read that from the kernel. But... Oh, you're right. Okay. Uh, talk mm-hmm. about the tip of the iceberg. Um. <laughs> I, have, I have no more questions. Again, I'm, 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 I keep saying this, that Illumos is really the most advanced Unix operating system out there. No, I'm, I'm amazed. And I think we should have more conversations. There's a lot more to learn. By the way, good job on using Zellage. This is a very good terminal multiplexer. Very, <laughs> very, very on the edge, man. Like I, I still use a screen, but like you're very on the edge. Okay. <laughs> it's a completely rustified terminal. So yeah. it's Alacrity, Selage, and New Shell on my local host. Oh, nice. And you're on Linux. Yep. So Zellage doesn't shell, run. What was the third one? Zellage, New Shell, and what? Uh, Alacrity. Ah, uh, maybe drop that in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's your host machine? Uh, a self-assembled five-year-old, massively powerful workstation. Uh, I mean, the operating system. Who who cares about hardware, right? Arch. <laughs> okay, nice. You're one of the people who wouldn't say, by the way, I use Arch. You're one of the people who would say, by the way, I use Illumos. So. <laughs> yeah, I use Illumos on every other system unless I need multi-monitor GUI because I have three monitors. I have... Spotify, I have Chrome browser, I have all of these nice things that only come in binary format, and I'm just not bothered in trying to get all the Linux binary running and all the web things nicely set up and Teams running and Zoom running, and it it kind of gets going. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So I'm very happy to use it as my primary server OS. Well, I'm very glad that you joined. I mean, we've chatted a lot over the years, but uh, having a conversation and uh, getting a lot of our uh, answers was was very much fun. And finally, we're like, Illumos got it right. And apparently it, it did. And this was a very, very interesting conversation. There's a lot to learn back and forth. Uh, One short question here. regarding Brent. So is the set of uh, hooks a... Uh, part of the schema for defining a brand or can I ha- add my own uh, um, hold and catch fire command to my new brand? Uh, it's part of the how to set up brand, so it's fixed. Okay, that explains how, how the sh- schema can be read, okay. It uh, uh, explains why there was one less nesting level than I expected. And you, uh, But you can have custom hooks, I assume? Uh, not really. Oh, you okay. just ha- you have that set of hooks, but it's mm-hmm. like every state possible has hooks. So oh, I see. I see. And if you don't, you have a state change hook that gets executed every time, and you okay. can just manually okay. match on a state that you get passed into it and do whatever you want. But you can pass your own stuff with the variables that you were talking about with the opt yep. org and stuff like that. Okay, yep. that's that's very. And you can pass those to Sony ADM, and they get passed to your brand script. Okay. Uh, Dan and Mohammed, do you have any questions? We have our amazing, mind blowing guests, and um, <clears throat> I'm just really enjoying my time listening, and I do, <laughs> I do agree to what Antronic said that. It look it sounds really uh, sophisticated and advanced. Yes. And Dan, I don't know if you're in a meeting. I'm fighting or... fires. Understood. Understood. Okay. Oh dear. <laughs> well, thank yeah, you. It was, it, was, it was great. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> yeah, I've never clapped on a Zoom meeting, but I'm tempted to. So, wow, <laughs> fantastic. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, of yeah, course. Cindy, yeah. That, just that was. Mind blowing. Yeah, if you are interested in a bit of a run up, a little sneak peek for the next stream on Tuesday, uh, I will be doing, uh, well, I do two part stream. The one, first part will be installing Illumos from the command line. So from scratch, this is not a distribution? Uh, we boot a distribution and basically just use the command line installer. A command line to do all the things from scratch like you do in Arch. Okay, nice. 
Yeah, I will definitely join that. Absolutely, that would be very interesting. And I do have like a, a bit of a question because this is uh, what bothered me in the Linux world is the existence of distributions. And what I, we, we all mm. here love in FreeBSD is like, okay, it's a single operating system. It's, it's, it has its own problems, but it's still a single operating system. In Illumos, you do have the fork model. And that has been something that Illumos people are very proud of. And yet there is not a lot of segmentation. It's like, okay, it's very clear. This is Debian-like in philosophy. Smart OS is like data center stuff, you know? But can you have like pure Illumos with a package manager with IPS that is like not distribution, that not bound to any distribution? Is that a thing? You need to assemble the repositories yourself. Okay. And at that point you are a distribution technically. Okay, I see. I see. Uh, so that's so, so how, the, how we handle it. So so Illumos provides the tooling, but the distributions provide things like updates, upgrades, and packages. And yep. let's say the brands and everything that goes with all of that. Okay. Yeah. So in, in Illumos land, we have a definition called gate. Mm -hmm. And every gate is basically the distribution. And the distribution is usually consists of two gates, the user land gates with the package manager, source, the brands, whatever the distribution does as to placement of compilers and so on. And a Lumos gate, which is a collection of corn shell, loader, linker, and so on. Nice. The facilities. Yeah. Yeah. And the Lumos gate is basically not self-hosting. You need a distribution to build it. Mm -hmm because uh, build requirement also includes things like OpenSSL. Oh. And that requires a distribution to build your stuff on. But you can compile any of the Illumos forks on any other distribution and then have a set of an OmniOS fork, also, so Illumos with OmniOS patches. Uh, and we do a lot of effort into upstreaming, mainly collaboration. So we have Garrett and we have the central yeah. bug tracker, yeah. which is overarching over everything. And this was actually interesting. So you can have, let's say, a global zone, uh, a host, basically, that's running, let's say, smart OS, but a zone that's running Omni OS. Yep. That's very, yeah. That's, that's how nice the idea. Open Indiana package server runs. Oh, how do you uh, deal with kernel ABI divergence? You fail. <laughs> <laughs> so if some there, there is a very famous blog post called "Multi Kernel Drifting," uh, where Oxide found the one case where we actually had an ABI divergence by accident. Okay. Anything else is the Lumos core devs are all in one IRC channel and they are very, very specific to not do it. Okay. If so they do it, do... however, there is a stable interface on libc. So everything on top of libc is stable, everything below not. If you do a zone with a different distro, you may fail. It's accepted is, that that happens. Is libc really the only library which is tied to the kernel or are there like yep. in FreeBSD special companion libraries for some low level stuff which are they're companion oh. libraries but we were thinking of merging them but we never got around to do it okay and you just uh, have a tightly knit group uh, maintaining ABI compatibility <laughs> in lockstep yep. uh, okay uh, all working I, I for want... the same company <laughs> I want, to close this. <laughs> I want to close this by our famous opening question that we ask everyone who joins us for the first time, but I think we never got into it. How did you get into, we used to ask, how did you get into FreeBSD? But in your case, it would be, how did you get into Illumos? I didn't want to get systemd. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You went the most far away possible. Okay. I ended up in Linux with, open, with SUSE Linux Enterprise. 11 back in the day in my apprenticeship and then they started introducing system d and everybody was like uh, against it and somebody told me hey the, there is this open solaris thing that uh, the, was the original uh, i 
the things in computing that I ended up doing was that because I at some point found out it was very capable and I started to miss all the Illumos features in Linux and I was like, uh, yeah, I, 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 I want to be on Illumos. Yeah, the system yeah. D thing was, uh, I think, there was a turning point for many people. Yeah, that, that <laughs> me, was me, the Twitter me, of the me tech too. world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like they made it so bad that people yeah. wanted to find it. Okay, so there are alternatives, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, time for us to wrap. Time for us to wrap. Thank you very much, Till. It was great. Yes. What a shame. Yes, profound. Thank you. That was thanks. That was awesome. Awesome knowledge. Thank you very much. This was very, very helpful. Uh, I would like to ask, yes. are you going to, to share the, the link for uh for the streaming that it's the Twitch chat. The Twitch stream oh, okay. link is in the doc or on the yep. one very first. And I have a YouTube and a Twitch. And I'll just post them down in chat again for everybody. And there you go. Thanks.